limit for things. So just wanted to put this out. Uh, this is one of the reasons for the duty, if I have two, because these pictures really say more than a thousand words. OK, so let's do math. The most outrageous I couldn't resist. Look at this. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know. I could be staring at this all the time. I'm feeling so enraged. OK, <laughs> this is much nicer. You know, let's pretend, you know. OK, so let's, let's review where. You know, we were studying curves in the torus with a boundary component. And uh, I brought the torus just, oh, did I, I, yes, I brought it, among a thousand other things, just in case I think I'll need it, and my yarn. So we were studying, uh, you know, remember that these red spots here are like holes, and you know, when you try to, you know, we are discussing curves out of the formation. You know, sometimes certain things you can do here. This is, as the talk of Priam yesterday, this is a lift. You know, this is a, a cover of the torus. Imagine that I can roll this, you know, in this direction. I get a cylinder, an infinite cylinder. And then, well, it's a little stretch of imagination, but you can roll it in the other direction, and you roll all this figure around the torus. It's not the universal cover. We can discuss this. Why? But it's one cover. It's one uh, other space, two-dimensional, that I can project. And I project you know, as, as a map from this cover to the torus that is really nice, in the sense that locally, it's very regular, and it's, it's very, very it's like, between quotes, the, uh, the, the, the space we are covering, in this case, the torus with a boundary component. So when I deform this curve here, some deformations I have, I can project them to down. Not, not all of them. I have to be careful. If this is a lap of my curve, and you know, when I move, this is a hole. I cannot go. You know, this, is, this is the invisible. There's nothing here. So you cannot move and pull this over this. But you can wiggle the curve. So in particular, one thing we cannot do is move it like we had before as a curve here to here. So really, in, uh, well, if we look at the, the, this curve, I could also grab each of the pieces and pull them here, chuk, 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 and then we will see a curve like we had before in the, in the surface, you know, made of little branches. So this curve, you know, to, to label it, what we do is uh, we just record every edge we cross. And the edges, I thought I'd put a label, but, well, they, should, they are labeled, you know, this is A, A bar, B, B bar, say. So we counted the curves, and basically, we saw that they are the same. Uh, if you fix the word length, we have as many as we had in the closed torus. Because, I mean, the closed torus, it really matters, you know, how many steps in this direction and how many steps in the directions. But if you fix the two endpoints and you stretch your, your curve, then for each curve in the closed torus, you get a curve in the torus with a boundary component that is simple. I mean, we will get another curve. This one, notice also that if I want word to see the simple is I can pull all these little pieces. You know, this one will go here, this one will go here, and I will get, you know, all these parallel lines. So, uh, so we counted. Let me skip. Oh, let me use my technology. And we saw that since there are as many as we had in the closed torus, here you have this, it, you know, of word lengths exactly L, you have the Euler function of L, which is the number of positive integers that are relatively prime and whose sum is L. So this is for exactly L. If you want smaller or equal than L letters, you sum all these Euler functions, and one knows. There's a nice older proof about this, um, a few proofs, uh, many proofs, in fact, that this grows like 3L squared divided by pi squared. And, uh, and I was reminding you also that we did this experimental counting with the word length. And we saw this is the, the column here is the coefficient. We saw that 
when I did the experiments with you know, this computer there, the number of simple no crossings, cur closed curves in the torus, classes of curves, the formation classes, grows like a constant times L squared. And uh, this constant can be approximated by these numbers because here I'm, the, I'm summing and adding up all the, the formation classes, which is all the words I have up to a certain word length, and then I divide by L squared. So I recover an approximation of the coefficient. And this is, we got this is 127. And it's so pleasant to see that, you know, this is exactly, if you, if you multiply by 4, the 3 times pi squared, which accounts for, you know, the, the four directions you can have your curves, you get 1.21, you know. So even with word length 20, you know, it's very close like this as it should be. Any question? This is what we left. Okay. So now let's, let's do this study. So simple curves are, the, the punctual torus is a special in the sense that all the curves we know crossing are the same. Now what do I mean by the same? Do you think they are deformable one into the other? Anybody want to risk an answer? Take, you know, look at a torus with a hole and look at a curve that wraps around chuk, 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 like the ones we saw and maybe, you know, look at a curve like this that goes around and maybe it's just like this. And let's look at another one, you know, a very easy one, just like this. Do you think I can deform one into the other? No. Of yeah, of course, you're right. No, we can't. They're the same. Uh, not in this same. <laughs> They're the same that if I remove the curve, physically remove the curve out of the torus, I get a, s I get a cylinder with a hole. Well, here I forgot this. I'm thinking about boundary component, or yeah, no, yeah, punctual torus. So I get, if I remove the curve, what do I get? I get a cylinder with a little hole, that is a sphere with three holes. Because, you know, when you destroy the torus, you know, the, there's not many surfaces you can get, and you think a little bit, and it's a torus. So in this sense, they are the same. It's another, you know, way of finding an equivalence relation between curves, not the uh, free homotopy we discussed before. Another way to say this same same <laughs> is that uh, there is, there's a rejective map between, you know, well, the, the from the torus to itself that maps this curve into this curve. This map is rijective, it's continuous, and the inverse is continuous. That's a homeomorphism. Yes? What if you draw a loop around the puncture? Ah, ha, ha. What if I draw a loop around the puncture? What, what? It's not the same. You're right. <laughs> I, that's a special case that, you know, I don't, you didn't consider. You are completely right. That's a special case in the sense that there's nobody else at that curve. <laughs> Every homeomorphism will map that curve into that curve. In other words, if you remove it, there's, there's no, yes. So that's correct. It's put that here in your mind. Everybody has Cam's observation here. Yes, yeah, that curve. So, uh, So let's see what I'm saying here. So we have, yeah, here is what happens when you remove, is this working the, oh here, I have to be stronger. This is what happens when you remove the curve, you know, no matter this curve or this curve, these are all simple curves, but what you get topologically is this. So let's study now what happens with the classes of curves of self-intersection one. Let's see if they are all the same in this sense. And by the way, all, if you look at all the curves, that when you remove them, you get you know, the same, topologically, the same surface or surfaces. That's, we are going to call it the orbit. The orbit is because it's also, there are also images under these <coughs> maps, homeomorphisms. So, uh, okay. Anybody can see a curve of self-intersection one here? Ah, oh, you saw that movie. No, 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 no. <laughs> Come on, somebody here. The curve 
A figure eight? Kind of, well, it's like around the surface and then goes behind and then crosses itself. Okay, come here and point it. <laughs> no good, it goes unpunished. <laughs> come on! It's <laughs> here. <laughs> it's good, it's good to be, you know. I'm, I'm like the, so that like wraps around the front and then goes around the back. Uh huh. Back out, goes around and then crosses itself in the back. With Let's draw it. I mean, let's see. Everybody should be thinking because here, yeah, color. So, like this. Okay. Good. That's a good one. Yeah. But yeah. Now, yeah. Good. Thank you. Uh, this is one, and this is one. <laughs> this one, uh, it's, it's, it's one. Is there another one? Huh? Go around both holes in a figure eight. You can go around both holes in a figure eight, right. You can go around like this, like this, and like this. Is there another one? You go twice around like this. Yeah, this, so here, these are the two curves. So this is the one, you know, the, the figure eight uh, just mentioned. This one, you know, when I remove uh, this curve, and when I, well, we're going to study what happens when I remove the curve of the torus, and what shapes do we get? If you look at it, do you think we get the same shapes when I remove each of this? The hint is there are two orbits, so no. <laughs> but, you know, why not? Well, here you see, for instance, Maybe I should be more precise with what I mean by the same. When I remove this one, I'm going to get this disk that has this point here. Now we have extra information to add to keep track of you know, who's in what orbit. So here I have a disk. This is a disk with a hole and a little marked point, which is intersection point. One of the components, I get two components. One of the components I get when I remove this curve is now this is a disk. This one is a disk with one hole but there's two sh special points, you know, because when I cut, imagine that I come with my scissors and physically cut, I'm going to separate. So let's say I have a piece of the point here, and a piece of the point here, the point is marked, so I, you know, it's part of the information. So these are not the same in that sense. And why I said, it, you know, when I, you have a homeomorphism, on this map that respects all the topology of your surface, you know, when you should map pieces like the one we are describing, these complements to equal to, to the same pieces. The homeomorphism respects all the structure. That's why, uh, you know, these two definitions are the same in these cases. So these are the two orbits. So and, and then, so yeah, and then there's yours that says you go to us around. Let me just say, which is a power which I'm not conscious. So going around in this direction is different than this. Oh yeah, sorry, I was asking about these. Yeah. Yes. What? Well, imagine that I come with a scissor and physically cut. Do you have a scissor? I can cut the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so if I physically cut here, mm -hmm. I here when I arrive to this point, oh. I mark a point, and then I go around again, another point. When you open up, the shape you see is this, and this and this is the same point that I'm going to glue. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. Okay, so, so these are the two possible ones. Besides, of course, we have this one. This is a power. Now, how can I distinguish this one or from this one? Well, what's that? Are they the same? Huh. Well, let's, let's look at the, you know, what happens when I cut it. When I cut this, you know, what I get here is, so here I have, uh, it's this with the point. 
when I cut this one, the hole is inside. Now, this is this piece. I don't know if you see that. So the hole is inside. Here I get this. So the hole being inside makes a big difference. This one, if you try to deform it into, this one you can really see is a power here. If I try to deform this into a power, I won't be able to because I want this to really go parallel and nearby. So if I try to pull this and go it around, you know, this stays here. So this I'm going to have all this piece of the curve going like this. Yeah, maybe. Yes, let, let me. Uh, I'm going to do the same one, but a little. It's the same curve. So here I have the hole. Let's first, let me do something and then I redo it. So here, this is the same curve. Oops. Here. Not the same, the same in the, you know, the orbit point of view. Let's try to deform, I'm saying, this loop into the outer loop here. You know, well, you cannot here because you have this, this hole. So one way you say, can say let, let's go back. You know, we have this topology, let's use it. So you can slide this curve, you know, the inner curve, and going, going through the back, but this one stays here. Oh, I can't, should I make a better picture? So, you know, when I slide, if I try to slide, you know, and I go here, and then here, there was, suppose I leave my finger here with the intersection point. There's a piece of the curve that will, every time when I slide, it will go through the back and it will accompany my curve and go back. So there's no way, I mean, I can deform it because I, I will have this extra loop. You have to play around with it. Make a picture, that's a good thing for the, for the review session. Make pictures on, my pictures are very limited, <laughs> but uh, you can do that. Now, this type of curve is the same story, except that you know, we are looking at now a curve goes, goes this way. And you can see it also, maybe, if we draw it this way. Let's put the, this, the crossing in the front. So big difference is whether the hole is here or here. Because the cutoff pay piece will have a hole or not. Yes. When you cut, you get two pieces, and in both yes. of those curves, one of them will have the hole, one of them won't. And like, how can you say like which piece? No, no, no. Is it's not they have it or not. What I said is, I record I pass through a crossing point. It's just an information I attach to my cutting piece. Okay. I just said, oh, here, I touch the crossing point. I, I, I'm gathering information to if, when you give me the pieces to reconstruct it. Okay. No. <laughs> the eyebrows talk. <laughs> so. I don't understand entirely what the special points are. This is a crossing of the curve. Okay, but that has two, right? Yeah. This has one crossing. So when I cut, <coughs> when I cut, I say, so I come here, say I start here. So I go around, 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 and I find the crossing point. So I'm going to record what I find with my scissor. I go around, 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 and here I found a crossing point. So I did this, no? I did crossing point. Then I go around and find another crossing point. So I keep going, and I find another crossing point, and then I go back. So here I said I touch a crossing point. That's it. If I had two crossing points, I would say I touch a crossing point number one and the crossing point number two. But it's just the information that is stored in the boundary of, you know, the shape I'm finding. So there's one point there, but because it's sort of a special point for two different arcs on the 
Right, then, then you know, when I have to, imagine I have to reattach, you know, I said, okay, l let's see, I think I, I put a picture, let me, uh, let me get my next slide because I put a picture, and uh, let's not talk about this now. So this is what I get, like my eye, you know, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> so one shape is this uh, kind of disc with a hole and the mark point, and the other, you know, when I remove this, it's a cylinder that also has this, you know, pieces of the point. I mean, the point appears four times, because here there are four sectors, you know, the four uh, pieces of the curves that, I, that, I'm, that I'm seeing. And this is just because if you give me this, and I don't know this picture, I can reconstruct, well, I should say maybe who goes, in this case, it's so easy that I can do it without that. Just with this information, I can reconstruct this, because I grab the blue point, attach it here, and keep attaching the edges until I, you know, put it here again. It's like a mark. Okay? And uh, I colored it so we could see, you know, who's where, and you know, one side is orange, the other is green, and it's just, again, a way to being able to reconstruct. Okay, now this curve, as I mentioned, will have the same decomposition when I, when I cut. I get the same, you know, it looks different, but I get the same stuff. And this one too. And here I painted. <laughs> iPad is good, <laughs> helps you erase. So you see, if you can see, you know, this, this yellow thing, it is like a disk with a hole and these two special points. So these are all curves or classes of curves in the same orbit. Because, you know, when I cut it, I get the same shape, but also because they're homeomorphisms. And really, in, the, in this case, the shape really tells you the homeomorphism because if I give you two disks, you know, you know how, to, if I give you the pieces, you know, this, if you have the, these pieces, I make a duplicate and I can make a map, the identity map between pieces, just like that. And then you reattach them in a smart way and you have your homeomorphism. So if you know, if you have, this is a just a bijection, identity between this and this, when I glue them, you know, I know that I can glue this and obtain this and I can glue this and obtain this. So that gives you a homeomorphism between this and this that maps this curve to this curve. Takes a little work, but think about it. Okay, so this is now all the, all the orbits, and I'm not counting powers again, with two crossings. Now, I'm not going to discuss you know, why these are all, but, uh, but you can see it, it's not that hard because if you have two points that you know they are crossings, you know there are four branches coming out of it and you have to join them in, in this, the combinatorics are finite and you have to join in a meaningful way. So this is what they are. Now, oh, I didn't say, hmm, let me go back for a second. Here. So what is the count on this? Well, interestingly enough, you can use the count of simple curves to count these, these orbits. We know that up to word length L, we have a certain constant, which was 6 divided by pi squared times L squared, more or less curves. So word length up to L, you, we have that. Well, it turns out that if you want to count this type of curves, you have the same amount. You have simple, but instead of L, the world length, you have to put L minus 4. This is because it costs you four letters to go around the boundary component. And why it costs you that? Because if you remember the picture, I didn't do it here, but you have four pieces of arc you know, coming out you know, when we do the cut. There are four, you know, one you know, like this, and the other one you know, like this. So these are the four letters you record to go around it. So this is, you know, cost four. And this one, 
it's almost like a simple one squared. You know that you know we saw the similarity when we were discussing, and in fact, they are closely related. This one is like two simples. So more or less, uh, I think it's an else divided by two here that I. Uh, this one, they have to have word length even. Yeah, here we need L divided by 2. And so you count, you have to, you know, with L even, you divide L by 2, you count how many simples you have, and then you can count how many of this type you have. OK, let me see what's next. And now oh, we are working here. This is we are uh, just join work with Viveka. We are uh, where is where is she there? So you can ask her too, not me about this. Okay, so let me move to my next. Uh, I want to discuss a little bit of hyperbolic geometry today. I mean, it will be this is a beautiful. I mean, so many topics are beautiful. This is really a beautiful topic and. Uh, I mean, I can only do Google super fast overview, but I wanted to talk a little bit of some results. You know, this, you know, some of the things are, you know, being researched right now. So uh, I need to discuss this before. So let's see what do I mean, you know, what do we mean by hyperbolic? You heard this word before, but uh, let's, let's go a little deeper into that. So suppose I have this, this surface. This surface, you know, you imagine it's flat. Can you? Put it flat on the floor, it's just a piece of paper. Yeah, you put it there and it lies flat and it, everything lies. What about this? Can you cut it and put it flat? Why not, Murphy? Huh? You remove a point and can you put it flat now? Oh, sorry, I should have said. Now it's geometry, so things are, we are deformation, you know, now we are. Rigid. Now you cannot lay this down flat on the floor. Imagine that you know when you peel an orange, you know you cannot put the peel totally flat and make a nice surface. You know you have to there's not enough material in some sense to make some flat thing. Was that? Yes, curvature. What about this? Can you put this flat on the floor? Why not, Susan? Huh? This, this, yeah, this, this, we can see it. You know, there's too much material there. In the case of the on the, the sphere, we have holes. In the case of here, we have overlap. There's too much. If this is cloth. There's too much cloth. So, oops, sorry. Oh. This, then we said there's three types. This is, you know, I'm going to say what I mean by geometry. You know, like. Geometry now, we're going to think two-dimensional. When I say geometry, I want to think two-dimensional. And you want the, something that is homogeneous, in the sense that no matter what you stand up in your space, you would see the same landscape. And if you turn, you also see the same landscape. So these are the three types that we find. So and we're going to, you know, now we can measure length of curves. So let's see how to quantify this uh, curvature. I heard something say the word. So suppose you have x, this is our space, and you have a point. And then you want to find a circle in that point and measure its length, a circle of certain radius. So here we have, in the plane, the circle of radius r. Gosh, this is big r, this is small r, they are the same. You know this is 2 pi r. Now, what happens if you make a circle on, say, a sphere of radius r? Now the radius, this is r. r is the length of this curve here. So how the length of the circle here would compare to the length of the circle of radius r on the plane? Hmm? Smaller. It's smaller. Because you know, if, if your radius looks like this, and you have to go around, you know, like, and if your radius is like this, you know, but my, the length of my finger is the radius, of course, the circle and the flat is small. So here it's shorter. Now, what happens here? 
Sara, what do you think? The Korean one, no, 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 this is the, we're talking about circles, okay, this is my mistake. We're talking about circles of the same radius, and we're trying to compare. The radius is, say, one. How do they compare? I have my, so this is a hyperbolic, I guess bigger. it's bigger, because if I have to go around, you know, like, this is my hyperbolic crochet space, if I go around, notice I go up and down, and I'm measuring the length of a curve. So this, you know, when I try to put this flat and look at it, there's too much stuff. So all this overlap will make more length. So here the circles of the same radius are longer than in the hyperbolic uh, plane. So this is one way to define curvature in two dimensions. We compare. Uh, the length of the circle in the Euclidean, we subtract the length of the circle in your space, the circle of radius r, and you divide by this pi r square. This is just a constant to get, you know, you want to get, what you want is this, the, the sphere of radius 1 has, for instance, curvature 1. And, uh, okay, so this is it. Let me just say one little thing, you know, that, well, no, no, I'm not saying, I think it's coming later, excuse me. So let's see, you know, Let's compare this with the spaces we know. So we know how to define distance in the Euclidean plane. You know, we have coordinates and, you know, we do that. How, would do, how do we define distance if you had to define distance on the sphere? What is a natural way to define distance between a pair of points on the sphere? Huh? Take the vector norm, Yeah, that's too much words. <laughs> that's good, that's good. But uh, anybody can help me with, uh, yes? Right, I just, yeah, I, I, you know, if I'm, if, you know, we are two persons, you know, on the earth, you know, we just try to find the shortest path between us and we measure the length on the earth, you know, we cannot leave our space. So this is how we find distance here. Now the distance in the, the torus, we can define it the same way, you know, just measure on the torus using the Euclidean coordinates in R3, but now we are on top of the sphere, so we had that restriction. With this notion of distance, notice that not every point looks the same, you know, because this point here is very different than the point here, for instance, the landscape. Now, the problem, one problem with the hyperbolic plane is that we cannot put it all in R3. Here, there are, you know, our two spaces, they are natural in R2 where we live, or kind of, uh, and, you know, it's natural. We, we have an intuition about the distance. The hyperbolic plane, yes, we have here the point. This is not, this, by the way, this, this one is, I don't think it's constant negative curvature. It's just negative curvature. Uh, and we cannot put the whole plane in a nice way, you know, like, so there's no way to define coordinates as we did in the sphere using what we know of R3. So instead of doing that, you know, we're going to use maps, maps now in the cartography sense. And there are different maps of the hyperbolic plane because you know this is a tool to visualize it. And I'd like to insist that these maps, the cartography maps, are not the object. The hyperbolic plane is some abstract thing that you can you have to see with our mind. But it's not the models you probably saw, the Poincare desk or the Abraham plane, you know. It's this two-dimensional space with constant negative curvature and you know a little more stuff. So so go back to, you know, curves. Now we said, you know, what is the shortest distance? So here I do a little arc. This looks a little straight, but you have to imagine it curved. And, you know, if I continue this arc, you know, in some way that every pair of points in the arc, the shortest distance is that piece of arc, you know, piece of red arc. This is a geodesic because if I find two points nearby on the curve, the shortest distance between these two points is the piece of the you know, red curve that goes from one point to the other. It locally realizes, it locally minimizes distance. Of course, that we say locally because you know, there's, a, there's also a distance you know, going around this curve, and that's not you know, the smallest distance. But if the points are close enough, 
the other distance. So this pass that locally minimizes distance we call geodesic. And you know, in, we know in R2 geodesics are straight. So we can, by analogy, say these are straight lines on the sphere. Now look at what happens when you look at these straight lines, coloring, you know, some map I've stole from, some picture I stole from the internet, so the coloring is not necessarily the same geodesic, you know, it comes red or flat, but, or orange. But this is, in the map, look at the geodesic. It looks very non-geodesic in some sense, you know, so we have to really train our mind to see, see what we mean, you know. The map sometimes might not look, you know, that the, the best way to go from here, say, to here is exactly this path. It looks like this. So sometimes what you see is not what you get on maps. This will happen with the hyperbolic plane. So here are some models of the hyperbolic plane, some maps. You know, one is a hyperboloid. This one, could a picture of, oops, sorry. I have to be very strong pressing, uh, here it is. This is the Poincaré disk, and you know, what Escher meant when doing this picture is that all these shapes, you know, the shapes that have the same mm, picture, they are congruent, they have the same size. In this sense, it's what you see, it's not what you get. In the same sense that, you know, it previously when we saw in the sphere that when you see the map, the two points that are joined by a geodesic don't look like, you know, that, that geodesic is the shortest path. Here is the same. These things are congruent. There was a hand, I thought. No, okay. This is another map which, you know, geodesics here are marked as straight. I'm not going to discuss this one. This is the upper half plane. And again, you have to think shapes that are, the, you know, the, those, these lizards, they are all congruent and they get more and more. This links to Sarah's talk where she was saying, you know, the closer <laughs> you get to the boundary of the space, here, here is a piece of the boundary, and here is a piece of the boundary, things that look Euclideanly close are in fact hyperbolically far. If you are close to the boundary, you're hyperbolic, you know, two points that are close to the boundary, they are hyperbolically far away from each other. Even if Euclideanly they look close. And there are more mouths, I just put this to, you know, insist that, you know, we have to try to learn what is this object and not get, you know, tied to the maps. So here is uh, one model, and I want to define, I need to make computations, so let's define a way of finding distance. So we're going to find the length of two curves. So you, you know, sorry, the length of a curve between two points. So you have a point here, P, a point Q, and some curve, say this one, and you want to measure the length. In this uh, hyperbolic plane. So what you do is just perform this integral. You probably see it, if you don't, you know, it's a little calculus computation, you can do it in Calc 1, 2, depending on where you see integrals. And then you say, well, what is the distance between two points? Well, choose the path that has the smallest distance. Of course here, I'm stating that there is a path that has the smallest distance, and there is. That's the line, you know, the straight line between them. In this case, this is the one that, you know, realizes the smallest distance. And it's inside this circle, which is one of the geodesics, the lines that locally minimize distance in this space. Okay. Here I have in the other model, and I, you know, this is a nice animation, and there's another, since this is another map, this is another way of measuring distances, and here is a, this is a square in the hyperbolic plane, moving around, and you know, moving around by an isometry, by the map I respect sizes and angles and everything, so you see that, you know, this, the closer you get to the boundary, the smaller you look Euclideanly. Ah, okay. Anybody play Pac-Man? It's not so dated. So in the Pac-Man, this is another way of looking at distance. What happens is if you are here in this point, you're very close to this point. And our mind knows that. Same thing here. If you are here, 
you know that you're very close to here, automatically our mind does that thing, you know? Where does the Pac-Man live? In which topological surface? It's a torus. So we've been, you know, in the torus all our lives, almost. Now, this torus, you know, we put the, now notice my politically correct renaming of the Pac-Man. <laughs> the torus, this torus here has not, you know, if you look at the metric that it has from R3, has not the, the Pac person metric. Because in the Pac-Man metrically, all the points look the same. We cannot do, I mean, this is an object that exists mathematically, but we cannot build it in R3. You can build it in your mind, you know, because when you play Pac-Man, you have the image of the torus. That's it. So there's two ways of putting metrics. It's amazing that in the torus, you can put a metric that will make it a geometry in the sense that I discussed in the very beginning, that every point looks the same, and you can turn and look the same. OK, so here, oh gosh, well, I started late. What can we do? Uh, so one way to put metrics is this pack person <laughs> uh, method, you know? So if you want to put a metric here, well, you're going to start with a certain uh, polygon. In this case, it's an octagon. You need a right angle octagon. We'll discuss why in a second. But then you're going to, you can, you know, the hyperbolic plane is so fantastic, but it has all this space where you can tessellate it by congruent right, no, yeah, right angle octagons. So this, you know, this is an octagon, this is an octagon. Here, you know, there's infinitely many octagons. The closer I get to the boundary, the exponentially more and more octagons I have. And, uh, and here I can put this, I can do the same trick. So we know how to measure length in the hyperbolic plane. I, I describe it in the, this is a Poincaré disk, you know, one of the models. So we know how to measure distance in, in this whole space. So we do the same Pac-Man trick, and we put a metric in the surface. And then again, this is a metric that looks the same no matter what point you start. It's not this metric again. It's, you know, it's a metric where every point is a saddle. You know, like every, every point. If you can close that in R3, well, come and see me. <laughs> OK, let's see, my last, almost last. And here is a little animation to show, you know, why do we have, these are all regular octagons. And the angles are varying in the hyperbolic. So notice that. The smallest octagon has angle 135. Do you know the 135 resonates in some way? What is the uh, measure of the interior angle of a regular octagon in the Euclidean? It's 135. So when, it, a rectangle, when an octagon is tiny, you know, when you are in a super tiny space, it's very similar to Euclidean. In the same way that if you're in a, if you're in a sphere, say the Earth, and you look around a little tiny space, well, it looks like flat. So this is the same point. You can also put a metric in the, tor in the pair of pants, because we are going to make a pair of pants, hopefully my coloring helps. Here we have an octagon, but now we are not gluing every pair of edges. I'm going to glue the edges that have the same color. So the octagon I'm talking first is this one. So I glue with glue, glue, glue light blue with light blue, and I, you know, and then, well, the white is already glued, so it's here. So this picture, you know, I can map it to this picture. It's like, this is the unrolling of the pair of pants. You know, a great advantage of the, you know, hyperbolic plane, it has a lot of space to unroll. When you have a pair of, you know, when you have to unroll a cylinder, well, we all had, you know, roll of toilet paper that psh, open up and, you know, crawl in the floor. You can do that. But here you have many directions to unroll. You, know, you open up and open up and open up, and you have to make space for the boundary components. So we, you know, all this is too big to do it in the hyperbolic plane. So, but you can do it in the in the Euclidean plane because exponentially, you know, this is um, what happens in the crochet space. 
that when you move forward, you know, you have more and more space cr crawling out. You know, you're in a saddle point. So around you, you know, there's like more land than they would, uh, that you would have in if you're in a flat place. Let's see what I have next. Okay, so now in the, here's, this is a, you know, negative, negatively curved thing. What is it, you know, if I have a curve, what is the shortest, you know, where will be the shortest member of the deformation class of this curve? Well, clearly you see, you know, if you have ding, it will go took around there. So this is a typical picture of, you know, negative curvature, you know. We have this, you know, kind of, you know, Chandrika made this cylinder, you know, that was like this, and you see the natural place. Why you have every deformation class as a unique geodesic because they, you know, that's that's the image you have to, you know, stick in your brain. So uh, again, this is this is the the geodesic now as shortest, uh, and then there's one more number that you can associate with the geodesic with the deformation class, which is the length of the shortest geodesic. It's a quite big feature that you have a unique geodesic. And uh, so to determine a metric on the pair of pans, a hyperbolic metric, it's enough to do it in the, in the three boundary components. I don't have time to go into that. But they can look very different. You know, This is just a cartoon of hyperbolic pair of pans. They have very, very tiny boundary components, and they have very big. And since you know, I am trying to make pans that are constant negative curvature, I have a lot of restriction. You know, once I you know, set up for these three lengths, all the rest get you know, fixed, and you know, it's very limited. Uh, well, maybe I'll stop, because, and I'm going to take a little over later with a, I wanted to say something about crochet. I take a little over with the with the review session. Okay, that's it.